so the problem. Uh, we have a set of uh, uh, polygons uh, in the plane. Uh, the polygons can be uh, very complicated, tangled, etc., etc., etc. And um, let's say n is the total complexity of the polygons that are given. And we want to compute the largest independent set of polygons of P. Namely, we want to find a subset of the polygons such that no pair of them intersect. So in this case, clearly, we can just throw away this, the irritating red polygon, and we get this. But of course, in general, it can be much more complicated. You know, you get a, a soup of polygons, and you want to find um, an independent set. And what is total complexity? Total, so for a polygon, the complexity is the total number of edges on the polygon. So the total complexity would be the total number of vertices in all the polygons. Um, so the main result of this paper is the following. You give me a set of m polygons, and is the total complexity. And you can compute an independent set where the total set, the total weight of the set is 1 minus epsilon times w opt. So w opt is. So the polygons have weights. You can assign a weight for a polygon. You want the, the set, uh, a subset of the polygon that have maximum weights, such as no pair of them intersect. So W opt is the weight of the optimal solution. And if you get 1 minus epsilon approximation, epsilon, of course, is a parameter you have to specify in advance. And the running time is this uh, monstrosity. So what is this monstrosity? It's m to the power of a polynomial, but the polynomial is uh, it's a polynomial of log n and 1 over epsilon. Okay, So uh, this is called quasi-polynomial uh, uh, running time. And I would speak more about this uh, shortly. So I'm going to use quite a bit uh, these words PITAS. So PITAS is called polynomial time approximation scheme. So this is an algorithm, it's an approximation algorithm where the input, you have an, a problem of size n, you have a parameter epsilon which is the quality of the approximation, you provide a 1 minus epsilon approximation, and you require that for a fixed epsilon, the running time is polynomial. Okay, so if you have an, algor if you have an algorithm that is property, then it's called a PITAS. Okay, and a uh, QPITAS, quasi-polynomial, is the same thing, except that they require that the running time uh, is quasi-polynomial, right? So the running time is n. For a fixed epsilon, the running time is n to the power of some uh, polylog. And uh, the, you know, to a constant. OK, so why care about QPITAS? Uh, so there is this famous quote from uh, Linus uh, Pauling is a, so this guy is pretty interesting. He's essentially considered to be the most important chemist in the 20th century. And he got two Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry, one uh, Nobel Prize for peace. So he's the only person that got two, two Nobel Prizes by himself. And he's very famous, that, or he's one of the uh, famous things that he said that there are no such thing as quasi Crystal only quasi scientists. So the story is that uh, there is this structure called quasi crystals, and he was strongly, he did not believe that they exist, and he thought that uh, it's all uh, quasi science, and he was wrong. Uh, and the reason I know about it is because the guy that discovered quasi uh, crystals got the Nobel Prize recently. And the reason I'm mentioning it is that uh, in some sense you could apply the same quote to uh, approximation algorithm. So we believe that there are no quasi-polynomial, uh, no QPITAS exist. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a problem where you can solve it in, qua in quasi-polynomial time, you should be able to solve it in polynomial time. So the reason to care about uh, quasi-polynomial time is that if you solve something in quasi-polynomial time, it's a strong motivation to believe you should be able to solve it in polynomial time, which is usually what we care about. OK, so how do we solve this independent set? Can you turn some of the light off, maybe? Because it seems a bit. OK, that's slightly better, I guess. Uh, 
Okay, there is another invisible rectangle here. Polygon on black background. It looks better on the screen, I swear. <coughs> well, okay. So the connection is not so good. Well, no, I think that uh, I should have put the background. Okay, it's my fault, as usual. Um, okay, so the regular way to resolve, to solve this, to attack this problem is you uh, create an intersection graph where every polygon is a vertex and you put an edge between two vertices if the two polygons intersect and really what you're looking for is an independent set in this intersection graph. So of course this is uh, uh, this problem of computing an independent set of vertices in a graph is NP-complete. Not only it's NP-complete, it's uh, monstrously hard to approximate so you cannot approximate it essentially between any polynomial factor uh, unless NP is equal to essentially P. ZPP is some randomized class. You can just think about it as, as P. And the problem is in fact cannot have a, a, a one plus epsilon approximation if, uh, even if the graph has the degree at most three. So this is really, independent set is really a hard problem. But the intuition is that if you have an independent set in an intersection graph, the problem is easier. Okay, so there is a quite a bit of work on independent set um, in geometric settings. Um, let me mention some of it. So, and, and I don't, you know, so uh, the basic idea is that uh, you want to look on fat shapes, usually convex fat shapes, and then you can use essentially uh, the Aurora technique. So you can use quad trees and random shifting to get a one plus epsilon approximation. The other technique that uh, uh, people use are uh, planar separators, which I'm going to talk about quite a bit later. The other variant of the problem that received a huge amount of attention is axis parallel rectangles. Um, so uh, we currently know log log n for the unweighted case, and for the weighted case all we know is uh, uh, slightly better than log n approximation. And um, I have a paper with Timothy Chan where we showed that local search works if you have a set of uh, pseudo disks. So uh, a set of regions in the plane of pseudo disk, if every pair of them, their boundary intersect only in two points. So think about a pseudo disk as essentially some kind of a stretched disks. Okay, um, there is other interesting result is line segments. So, um, Pankaj Agarwal and Nabil Mustafa showed a, a square root uh, opt approximation, surprisingly using Dilworth theorem. And uh, there is a paper of uh, uh, Fox and Park that get you n, for every epsilon can do n to the epsilon approximation. Um, and the idea there is somehow to balance between, it, it carefully looks on the structure of the graph and and do two different things depending on how sparse or dense it is. Now, uh, the most relevant work to what I'm presenting here now is this work of uh, Adam Adamczyk and Weiss. This is a, a, a soda and uh, then there was a follow-up, uh, let's see, no, there was a Fox paper followed by a soda paper and they showed one plus epsilon approximation the first paper worked for uh, uh, axis parallel rectangle. The second paper worked for uh, polygons that have uh, uh, up to a polylog number of edges. So they got one plus epsilon approximation. And, but the bad news, of course, is the running time is quasi polynomial. And um, the main idea was that they use cutting and planar separators. And I'm going to tell you what are those things and roughly how it works. Okay, um, so let me just mention a few, um, let me mention a little bit of complexity classes uh, still related to why QPTAS is interesting. So there is this complexity class called APX hard. APX hard are problems for which we believe you cannot do better than a constant approximation. So you cannot do one plus epsilon approximation. And the reason is because APX hard essentially, the way you prove it, you do reduction that preserve uh, approximation. And it all boils down to the PCP theorem. So the PCP theorem essentially shows that max 3 sat, if you can do 1 plus epsilon approximation for max 3 sat, 
then you can solve a three sat exactly. And uh, the second thing is that we currently have this conjecture called exponential time uh, uh, hypothesis at the edge, um, which says that the belief is that 3SAT cannot be solved in time better than 2 to the uh, some constant times n. Right? So there exists some constant in this little o such that um, such that any algorithm that uh, solves 3 sat must take at least this uh, time. Okay? Um, so now the, the observation is that if, if a problem has a, a quasi-polynomial time uh, approximation scheme and in, it's APX hard, then it would imply that uh, at the edge is wrong, but it's, it's widely believed that at the edge is correct. So, so as such, the way to think about it is that if you have a Q-Peters, you can assume that uh, the problem is not APX hard, and there is a hope to solve it efficiently uh, in polynomial time. Okay, so I mentioned it earlier, but... Okay, so in all this uh, soup of running time and so on, uh, it turns out that the right way of thinking about it is thinking about the running time uh, as a function, uh, as an exponent, exponent function. So the regular uh, polynomial time is just exp e to the power of O of log n. And f Peters, which is a fully polynomial scheme, is, you know, polynomial in n over epsilon. And this is Peters, and, uh, right, so this is Peters because for a fixed epsilon, uh, a Peters, you get the running time, which is polynomial. And quasi-polynomial, as you see, is, is essentially the same thing, except that I put the O of 1 here, you know, so small difference. But the kind of important thing is that, you know, look at this and look at this. So this is the the at the edge, or if you want exponential time, indeed there is a huge difference between this and this, right? In what you have in the exponent here, in the exponent you have polylog, here in the exponent you have a, a linear function. Okay, so it's a huge difference, and that's in some sense why it's interesting, right? So if you show that Q Peters, uh, you have a problem that has solved, they solve them in Q Peters time, in some sense you're saying that it's very far from being as hard as 3 sat. Or so we believe. Right, of course. Um, so that's that. And of course, you know, um, in some sense, uh, this is related to the exponential, the, sorry, the polynomial time hierarchy and so on, right? So there's really, uh, it's quite possible that there are a lot of interesting uh, time classes between polynomial time and exponential time. And QPeters kind of hint at least on one such class. Okay, so that was a general uh, introduction, and now I'm going to start uh, going more into low-level details. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so um, so the first thing I want to, to speak about is a, a little bit about separator and sparsity, and why it's interesting. So first, let me mention a planar separator. So, planar separator is, the, is a well-known theorem from uh, the late 70s that shows that every planar graph, if you have a planar graph with n vertices, there exists a separator of size square root n. So, what is the separator? If you remove the square root n vertices, the graph breaks into uh, two or more connected components, and every connected component have, let's say, at most two-thirds n of the vertices. Um, and there was a very nice paper of Miller that showed, in fact, that if the graph is too connected, so, you know, the right way of thinking about it, just think about it as a triangulated graph, every face is a triangle, then not only there is a separator of size square root n, but the separator is a cycle. It's uh, just a simple cycle in the graph, uh, and there are some other follow-up work which is not relevant here. Okay. Um, so this is the planar separator. The other thing that is interesting is uh, sparsity. So we will be interested in, in graphs where the number of edges in the graph is near linear. Okay? Um, so in a lot of interesting classes of graphs are like that, like planar graph, log graph, etc., etc., etc. 
And a well-known theorem in extremal graph theory says that if a graph, for example, doesn't have the bar bipartite graph clique KTT, then the number of edges in this graph is uh, subquadratic and is uh, bounded by this. Uh, this is a, a nice exercise if you want to try and prove it yourself. Um, <coughs> but somehow, if you look on intersection graphs, this property is much stronger, right? So, if you tell me that, um, so you give me a set of objects, and we look on the, uh, so you give me a set, let's say, of curves in the plane, and you tell me that every pair of curves intersect only a constant number of times. Um, and I look on the intersection graph, right? So the v every, every curve is a vertex, and there is an edge if two curves intersect. And now, let's assume that you tell me that this graph is sparse, right? So you're, what you're telling me, you're telling that for, I, in fact, I'm taking slightly stronger properties. So for every subset of the vertices, if I look on the intersection graph on this subset, the number of edges is subquadratic, okay? So, um, which, for example, can happen if you assume this condition, right? Um, so what they proved is in this case, not only the number of edges is small, in fact, it's linear, right? So somehow, the fact that you, this graph is an intersection graph really gives you a lot. It really um, buys a lot of structure. And let me show you the proof. The proof is kind of uh, is easy, and it kind of hints to the kind of tools that uh, we need or we use here uh, later on. So we have the set of uh, the curves, and we compute the arrangement, right? So computing the arrangement means we compute all the intersections, uh, the compute uh, every curve have the two endpoints, and then all the intersections of vertices. And once we insert them, what we get is we get the planar graph where every contiguous portion of a curve is the edge, right? So we have this planar graph. And because I assume that this graph is sparse, by assumption, the number of edges is subquadratic. But since this graph is subquadratic, it's going to have a, you know, it's a planar graph. It has a, it's a planar graph. The number of vertices and edges in this graph is smaller than this. As such, there is a, separate, a vertex separator of this size, which is, if you look at it a bit, you would realize it's sublinear. So there is a sublinear of vertices such that if I uh, cut uh, the graph at these points, if I cut the graph at the point, I get two graphs, and I roughly divided the number of uh, uh, edges more or less equally on both sides. <coughs> and the overhead is very small, right? Essentially, the number of new edges, I uh, the number of new curves I created, if you want, in this split is, is this. Right? And now I can bound the number of, uh, uh, the number of uh, intersection in each one of those two parts recursively. So if I do that, I get essentially this recurrence. Right? I get t of n. I have to pay for this number of vertices on the separator. And then I have to essentially uh, call recursively on both sides. Right? And I add up the number, and that would bound the total number of vertices on the separator. So I have this recurrence. I oversimplified it a bit. But essentially, if you think about it, this is the regular, if you want, the quicksort recurrence, except that instead of linear, I have here something that's sublinear. And the solution to this recurrence is linear, which implies, indeed, that this graph has a linear number of vertices. Does it work when the curves intersect more complicated than in your drawing here? Sorry? Does it work when the curves intersect in a more complicated way than in your drawing? So it looks like each pair of curves intersect at most once. No, so I, you, I assume constant number. They have follow-up paper when they handle the case where the number of intersection is, uh, arbitrary. is arbitrary. Yeah. But then you have to work harder. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, so we will come back to these both themes of this sparsity property and this planar separator. OK. Um, so I would like to, uh, so the reason I care about sparsity is because I would like to think about independent set as just one family of sparse, uh, uh, sparse uh, creatures. So formally, you give me a set of polygons, and I can look on a property. 
Okay, the property, for example, can be the set of uh, uh, polygons you give me is uh, independent, right? So more generally, the way to think about it is that I have a hypergraph where I have uh, the set of polygons, which is the ground set, and then I have all the subsets that are allowed. Those are all the subsets that have the property that I care about. And again, the task is to compute the heaviest, uh, or if you want, the largest subset uh, in this set, right? Again, think about the property here as the subset is independent, right? Okay, and I want to require the following properties. So I want to, uh, first I want to have this hereditary property. So if, if a set X has the property, so does any subset of it. I want to have the property that it's mergeable. If I have two sets, two subsets that are disjoint, then they're and x and y both belong to the property, then the union belongs to the property. The third property I need is this sparsity condition. So if a set has this, uh, uh, if the set, every, every subset that has the desired property, the intersection graph it defines has a subquadratic number of edges. And finally, I want this, the, you know, the, I finally require the, the you know, the property that I need for my algorithm, I require that this property is polynomial time checkable, right? So if you give me a subset and, and you ask me, is it, does it have the desired property or not? I can test for it and I can test for it in exponential time. Okay, I don't even need polynomial time, which is nice. So, so the second result of this work is to show that if you have, if you give me a weighted set of polygons or even pseudo disks, and uh, every pair of them intersect a constant number of times, and now you give me this property, you give me this property that have all this nice behavior. Intuitively, this property is similar to a metroid. It's not a metroid, but it's in some sense similar in in, in some way to a metroid. If you give me such a property, then I can compute. I can compute uh, uh, quickly a good approximation to the largest subset that have the desired property, okay? Now, uh, instead of going exactly over it exactly because the details are kind of involved, let me just tell you some implication. So for example, you give me a set of uh, disks, pseudo disks, and in quasi polynomial time, I can give you the, uh, the largest, I can give you the largest subset of the given polygon such that every point is in the plane is covered a constant number of times. You have to give me the constant in advance, but you know, this is an easy property to check and all the properties I listed before hold. Why uh, is that property mergeable? I mean, if you take two independent sets, why is the union? Um, because I asked they are disjoint, right? Um, Word. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, they are disjoint. Well, that says the families of polygons. Yes, yes, yes. What I'm. mean is they actually are? Um, right, so you need, yes, okay. So I lied. It has to be done more carefully. Sorry. Up to my life, it's all correct. Yes. Uh, okay, so you can do qu question like, you know, give me, give me the largest planar graph, in, you know, give me the, lar uh, the largest subset of the object such that the intersection graph is planar or has log -enus, or doesn't contain a big click. It's not completely clear to me why you should care about any of those things, but the point here is that independent set is just one possible condition on sparsity, and you can do the same algorithm for other families of uh, sparse, um, sparse polygon. Okay, so I want to now speak about how the algorithm works and some of the key ideas. Um, So the first thing we need, intuitively what we're going to do, the algorithm is going to be a divide and conquer algorithm, uh, uh, intuitively, and we need a way to partition the plane. Now in computational geometry, there is this uh, idea 
um, you know, how to do this partition if I give you just a set of polygon, uh, a set of triangles. So if I give you a set of triangles and you want to partition the plane into simple regions, you could just do vertical decomposition. So the idea is that you take every vertex and you shoot a ray up and down, and then the plane is divided into the original triangle, of course, and then you have those vertical trapezoids. And the nice thing is that every vertical trapezoid is defined by at most four triangles. So it decomposes the plane into those nice be nicely behaved tiles. Okay? Um, now, we would like to do the same thing for polygons. Why would we want to do this for polygons, I will show you shortly. Uh, and the question is how to do that, because the problem is that, you know, if I do vertical decomposition, uh, you know, if I have two polygons, I would like to, again, partition the plane into simple regions. And every simple region should be defined by a constant number of the input polygons. So, you know, if, I, if the two polygons are like that, this is completely hopeless, right? Because uh, the complexity of the decomposition will be proportional to the complexity of the polygons. And here I want a, a, a decomposition that have, uh, 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 is much simpler and have much lower uh, complexity. So formally, I would like to decompose the plane into regions where a region is defined by a constant number of the input polygons um, and you know, it partition the plane into those regions. Okay, so there is no hope to do vertical decomposition. In fact, there is no hope to do any of the immediately natural things that we do in computational geometry. So you need to have a more uh, topological approach to how to do that. Okay, so the idea is let's let's look on the polygons and let's go and compute their medial axis. So, uh, by the way, I just put a big square a frame on the outside just to uh, avoid dealing with infinity. Um, so, and I assume here, all, of course, that the polygons are disjoint. Um, and, and here also, because to make the drawing easier, I'm assuming that I'm speaking about the L-infinity medial axis. So what is the L-infinity medial axis? Well, uh, the point, a point on the medial axis is a point where I can put a square in it, and it touches uh, the input polygons in two points. Okay, so this is a point on the medial axis, and the vertices. Uh, oops. Okay, maybe I should go forward. So yeah, let me do that. The, a vertex. So you have we have uh, several kinds of vertices. We have vertices of degree three. I'm assuming general position. So I'm going to have either vertices of degree one, degree two, or degree three. A degree 3 is a vertex which corresponds to a square that touches the polygons in three points. Okay? Um, so now what I'm going to do, uh, now think about, I, all I have now is this, uh, the graph that is formed by the point on the medial axis. And the reason why people care about the medial axis is because it's, uh, um, it's a retract of the free space. It's a deformation retract. Okay, so now what we are going to do, we are going to take this medial axis and we are going to, uh, you know, uh, shave it. Okay, so um, if you look on the medial axis, you have this vertex here that is degree one. And so we have those tendrils. The tendrils are essentially not interesting because they correspond to portion of the medial axis where uh, it corresponds to points where it's equal distance from two points that are on the same polygon. In some sense, this does not give us interesting information. So we start, we just re repeatedly remove all the vertices that have degree one on the medial axis, and we are left with this creature, okay? And now we are going to care only, uh, intuitively we care only about the vertices of degree three. They correspond to those squares that, as I said, uh, touch the polygons in three points. And now for every one of those vertices, I'm going to put spokes from the vertex to the three points where the square touches the polygons. Okay, so I have this. Uh, and now we are done, right? Because now the complement of the polygon is, break, is broken into these uh, uh, regions. I call them corridors. What is a corridor? A corridor has a, a flow, which is a subchain of one polygon. It has a, a subchain of another polygon, and then it has two spokes in one side and two spokes in the other side. 
and it's easy to verify that every corridor is defined by a constant number of polygons. And so the corridor, every corridor is defined by a constant number of polygons, and uh, every corridor, of course, is simply connected, right? It, in fact, has this very simple ceiling for, uh, uh, and floor structure that I described. You can get some strange things like that, but, you know, intuitively, it's the same creature. Okay, so the nice thing is that now, because of planarity, it's easy to argue that the, the number of core, if you have uh, uh, m polygons, the number of corridors you get is O of m, and, uh, and that's it. So this is the correspondent, this corresponds to the classical vertical decompositions for polygons. Okay. Um, Okay, so this, this is the first step, and the reason why I wanted this kind of uh, decomposition is because I want cuttings. So what are cuttings? So cuttings are, uh, um, you know, an old uh, structure in computational geometry going back to the 90s. Um, and the idea is that I give you a set of objects, uh, think about those objects as being disjoint. So let's say rectangles in the plane. And now uh, I want you give me a parameter r, and you want to decompose. You want to break the plane into simple regions, where every region intersects at most n over r of the rectangles. If we if our objects are rectangles, okay. So for example, here is one way of doing it. You pick a subset of the rectangle somehow. You go and you compute the vertical decomposition uh, of the rectangles. Uh, and now this, this vertical trapezoid, which is also a rectangle in this case, uh, all the things that intersect it are those red rectangles, and I require that their number is n over r. I think about r as being 2, for example. So really what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm breaking the plane into those, uh, a small number of tiles, where every tile contains only a, smaller num a small number of the original uh, uh, input rectangles. And intuitively now I can, whatever problem I'm trying to solve, I can recast on each one of those trapezoids and solve the problem inside each one of those uh, uh, trapezoids. Okay. So Chazelle and Friedman showed that there exists a one, uh, one over R cutting uh, of linear size, of R size. Uh, and the basic idea is what you would expect it to be, maybe, you take a random sample. So if you take a random sample, it doesn't quite work. You need to do a second level of sampling, and they do that, and that works. Um, and um, so what I prove in, the, in this write-up is that if you give me a set of these joint polygons, we have the same thing, right? So you give me a set of uh, polygons. This is a weighted version, doesn't really matter. I can compute uh, one of the R cuttings, and this R cuttings, it would be a decomposition of the plane into uh, R log R corridors, and every corridor, again, would intersect at most N over R of, uh, N over R of the uh, original polygons, right? So I'm, I, there is a way to decompose, even if you give me very complicated polygons, if they're disjoint, I can break the plane to a small number of pieces where every piece, every piece looks very nice and intersect relatively few polygons. So I can really do divide and conquer on these pieces. The proof is an extension of the previous proof, uh, of the previous result. The proof might be si slightly simpler, but you know, it's not, this is not the main point. Okay, finally I can describe to you the algorithm. And hopefully some of the things I was talking about would come together. Okay, so the basic, the basic scheme is going to be the following. I'm going to assume that they know the optimal solution, which is, ex uh, this is one of the reasons why this algorithm is bizarre, is that conceptually you're running the algorithm with the optimal solution, and then you argue about uh, how to do that. Okay, so uh, and let's assume that the optimal solution has m polygons in it. And I'm going to have a parameter r, okay? r is going to be some parameter, and I'm going, uh, the first step I'm going to do, I'm going to compute the 1 over r cutting uh, of the plane, 
okay? So one way of thinking about it is, is the arc cutting is going to look something like that. It's some tiling of the plane into those corridors. You can think about the corridor as some kind of a, a complicated polygon, but you know, it's the important thing is that each one of those corridors I can describe in a very compact way, right? I essentially have to point to the constant number of input polygons that define it, and that uniquely defines this, uh, this tile. Um, and the important thing is that, so what is the important thing? The, the, if I take this tile together, they form a planar map that looks like that. Now, uh, the, the right thing of thinking about it is that, you know, every one of those tiles might be intersecting a large number of the optimal solution, the polygon that go through this tile. I didn't draw them, of course, to keep the drawing simple, but, you know, just think about it, that there is some underlying set of polygons uh, under these tiles, where every tile is guaranteed to intersect at most this, uh, you know, M over R polygons. Okay, now I'm going to use the, the I, I'm just using the fact that if I take these cuttings, uh, this is a planar map, so it has a planar separator, right? And in fact, there is a cycle separator. So there is a, the cycle, and the cycle has uh, roughly square root R edges. The all tiled hide some polylog factor. We can ignore it for the time being. So I have a, a, a square root r number of edges that partition this uh, partition this cutting into two pieces that have roughly the same number of polygons. Origin, you know, it has roughly the same fraction of the optimal polygons inside and outside. Of course, there are some polygons that intersect the boundary, uh, that intersect the cycle. But the important thing to remember is, you know, the number of edges in the cycle is square root r, and every edge, every edge in this cycle can intersect at most m over r, uh, m over r of the original uh, polygons, because it's an r cutting, which means that the number of uh, polygons that intersect the cycle is relatively small. It's this, whatever this quantity is, you know, it's relatively small. And now here is what we are going to do. We are going to recurse. What do I mean by recurse? We are going to solve the problem now, find the largest independent set inside the cycle. Right? So we just recursively go and call to solve this problem in the, in the inside the rectangle. And similarly, we do it for the outside. Now, of course, what makes this difficult or problematic is what do we do about all the polygons that intersect the cycle? So we do the only thing we can do, which is to just throw them away. We lose them, right? So we are going to find a solution which doesn't have this, um, uh, doesn't have those polygons. So we are losing something in this recursion process, but hopefully we are not losing too much. Okay. Um, now, the important thing to remember is that the planar separator splits the solution more or less in a balanced way, which means that after logarithmic depth, we are going to come to a sub-problem that have a, only a constant number of polygons of the optimal solution. And once our sub-problem have only a constant number of, uh, of polygons in it, we can just solve the problem by brute force. Right, we can just do brute force enumeration and find the best subset. So, um, so we can solve the bottom of the recursion. Um, now, how does a subproblem look like? Well, a subproblem looks roughly like that. You have this outer cycle, and then in the lower level, you might count out some other subcycle. But because the depth of the recursion is uh, log m, and every one of the cycles have length uh, roughly square root r. Oops. Uh, okay, so, um, <coughs> okay, yes, okay, so a sub problem looks like that, right? Now I have, <coughs> think of what I'm going to do, I'm going to essentially uh, build a, a huge dynamic table where every one of those sub problems I store the best, the largest subset that I found. Right of polygons that are fully contained inside the region that it defines. Okay, now to do this, I need to specify the edges of the boundary of the subproblem. Right, but what is an edge in the subproblem? Well, an edge in the subproblem 
comes from this corridor decomposition, right? And an edge in the corridor decomposition would either a, a spoke or a subchain of the polygon. In either case, uh, there are only m to the uh, of one different such edges, right? So, so I can specify I can explicitly specify each one of those edges, and as such, if I look on the separator cycle, let's look on one cycle. I need to specify square root r edges. Every edge is m to the o of 1. So the number of possibility for the outer cycle is going to be m to the square root of r. Uh, and in general, because I have the inner cycle and so on, I get that the number of, uh, uh, number of sub problem I get is this function. OK? Now, I still have to tell you how I'm picking r uh, to make everything work. So what do we lose? In every level, OK, in every level, we are going to lose um, this fraction of the optimal solution. So this is just by going carefully through the details, um, you know, because the separator is square root r, this, this estimate comes from this quantity here, right? So it's m square root r. This is the number of the optimum we throw away when we do the divide and conquer. So if you go, if you compute it, you realize that in every level, we lose this fraction of the optimal solution is being thrown away. We have log m level. So the fraction, the total fraction of the loss is this, right? And we want this to be smaller than epsilon because we want an epsilon approximation. And now you just solve for r. You solve for r and you get that this r is some polylog. OK, and that if we pick R to be this, we get the polylog approximation, which means that our running time now becomes this. OK, so we get the quasi polynomial time approximation scheme. OK, so this is roughly the, the, the point. Let me, however, uh, go to the saying something critically important first. OK, so. When we did this divide and conquer here, right? When I did the divide and conquer here, I had to throw away the polygons, right? Now, of course, so I have this. I know what my cycle is, and I want to continue on the, let's say, the outside in this case. Now, of course, I don't know the optimum solution, right? So how can I do this recursion? So the trick is going to be that I have all the polygons, and I'm just going to when I call on the, le on the, on the sub-problem in the outside, what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep only the polygons from my input that are inside this region, right? So I run the same, I run this algorithm over the set of the, all the polygons, right? So when I recurse here, I recurse over the set of all the polygons, and, but you know, I'm imagining in my mind that I'm running this on the optimum algorithm, okay? So uh, that's how we implement the algorithm. The details, uh, this is the regular uh, case that this is one of those dynamic programming algorithm which are monstrously complicated. So if you really have to uh, understand all the details, you have to be extremely careful. But that's roughly what's going on. So um, let me conclude. So what did we do? We extended this uh, framework of uh, Adam Check and Weiss. Uh, to work for uh, uh, polygons that have arbitrary complexity. Uh, the basic idea for their framework was to use planar separator on cuttings. Um, and the two main things is that we should this it as for general setting. And uh, we showed that this, in fact, this kind of algorithm works on, not only for independent set, but for uh, more general uh, uh, sets where what we care about is, in fact, some kind of sparsity. And of course, the open, natural open problem for further research is to come up with the PITAS. So improve the running time, you know, improve the running time to be better, or even get a polynomial time approximation scheme. Um, of course, I have no clue how to do the, the PITAS part. That would be very interesting. And that's it. Thank you very much.